Um, okay, back for part two after a short interruption. Um, so I, I think a good place to start again would be to just think about the open problems. What do you think are big open issues for you in the, the architecture that we talked about? Because um, you said oh, there's still lots of problems to be solved on uh, on the gameplay level, at least that's what you mentioned on Twitter. I don't know if you would like to elaborate a bit more on that side of things. I think that we're still not used to separating things out. I mean, mm -hmm. we're still trying to... I mean, if you look at Unreal 4's animation system, the new one, the tooling's yeah. a lot better than what they've had in the past, but it's still fundamentally... Yeah. They expect you to do the gameplay decisions inside of the anim graph at the same time. Even the tutorials themselves are like, oh, you read the controller input, and then you pick an animation based on that. And I don't think that's a very scalable approach. I think that's yeah. your point, where you mentioned that graphs don't scale. Yeah. I think that that's false. I think that nothing scales if it isn't designed to scale. Sure. Yeah. I mean, so when you're scaling something, the, the first thing is to split things up. It's the same with a behavior tree, right? Behavior tree doesn't scale either if you just throw lots of complexity yeah. at it. Um, okay, so like uh, basically nailing down the layering or something. Um, yeah, or even, I mean, for example, a lot of guys that have started to understand that animation graphs are probably the most elegant way we've seen so far to to structure graphs to to basically to to use as a language for describing animation yeah. state yeah. even them it's hard to justify things like child graphs you tell them like well you need to use child graphs and they're like i i don't understand why that, that that's you know i can edit the whole graph with multiple users i can split it up into different sections when i edit it it doesn't make sense to me i'm like yeah. It, it's not about addition, it's about swapping the, the functionality at runtime. It's about not knowing what the functionality is. Mm -hmm. So you can just inject it as the game's running. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot of these things where... I, I guess I've, I've been lucky that my last two projects that I was on were very focused on post-launch content and service-style games. Yeah. And that kind of makes you think a lot about how do we produce content afterwards without breaking the existing content, mm -hmm. how do we do it with safely, how do we do it cheaply. I was less concerned about super fancy tech than I was about um, productivity and, and tooling. And this is what primarily scares me about the motion graphs is that the lack of tooling, <laughs> yeah, yeah, the lack yeah. of visibility, the lack of tooling, lack of debug tools, yeah. all of that has to be invented, has to be tried. Yeah. I mean, you could be basically think of motion graphs as another way to generate whatever animation graph you have now, right, as a separate pre-process in a way. But, um, yeah, I mean, the tools are not there now. I mean, we spent ages no. at Rockstar building these things. It takes a really long time, much longer than you think. No, no, it does. Uh -huh. Because you, you don't know what you need. You don't know how to visualize. We tried the approach with the, uh, the bitmap map, the bitmap uh, with the similarity matrix. Oh, yeah, the, yeah, the, for the time alignments. Yeah. It's sort of relatively, it gives you some visualization, but it doesn't give you the whole picture. And yeah, also, yeah. you don't know what poses those matches. You're like, oh, this is similar, this is not. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know what the end result's going to visualize, whereas with the graph, it's, yeah. th we know what the tools are supposed to be, so yeah. for reduction, it's easier. And that is the same problem with motion fields, right? Yes, and both of these approaches, I actually really like them. And I actually see a lot of use for Is that why you're reading all the papers, despite all the... Exactly, yeah. <laughs> exactly. There's a lot of problems that they solve in a very nice way. And that's stuff like, for example, an impact system, like uh -huh. a physically-based impact system, like interacting with physics. You can mocap yeah. a bunch of hit reactions and have it pick an appropriate one based on uh -huh. you know, a physics response. Yeah. And that you can't do with a graph. Like, I really think that motion graphs are very good in these sort of, as a node, as part of a larger graph. I think that both approaches need to work together. Yeah. Because as you said, even if you have a motion graph approach for locomotion fully, you still need to layer things on top of it. And how will you describe that layering in, in code? Or would you end up building some sort of a graph system to mm. say, you know, here's my locomotion motion graph and on top of that I'll I'll do my IK and my you know, my aiming and whatever else I need to add on top of that. Yeah. And I think that there's no silver bullet and that's, maybe I sound like I'm against the approach, but it's more like I'm scared of people that go all in, like they bet the house, the car. Yeah, I don't think, you could, yeah, else. yeah. So I've been on a team that did that and it uh, it turns out in the end to be a um, a standard pipeline where you just use these things as extra tools wherever they help. 
So you find it's just basically adding extra little pieces of algorithms or the pose matching wherever you need them in your pipeline. And that becomes a much more pragmatic approach of incrementally augmenting whatever existing tools you're using. Uh, exactly. with, uh, and I think that's a very sensible way to approach it in general. I, I had the same discussion with Michael a few years ago. Yeah. I was looking at the original motion graph on the one where you would chain clips together. Yeah. And I was like, this is bullshit, this will never work. <laughs> because you don't have the full range of motion. You can never follow a path or anything with it. And then we're like, oh, well, let's look at the parametric stuff. And I looked at him and I'm like, Michael, what's the difference between this and me just putting a parametric node? And he's like, uh, it's kind of this, the, the end result's the same thing. <laughs> and it was much faster just to, to stick in a solid yeah. parametric node with good tooling. But that being said, like, I, I'm very interested in looking into these things for things like balance control, mm -hmm. hit impact, these kind of things. And I definitely want to, that's why I'm reading the papers, I want to put them inside of any future work I do. But I want to do that as part of a very solid mm. anim graph foundation. Th that's it because, again, if you have that, you can sort of debug in a better way. You can say, well, I know my problems in my motion graph node. I know my, my layering of the poses that are coming out. I can see what's, what's going on. Yeah. And there hasn't been a lot of research into that area, I don't think. I'm a little bit behind in my literature server right now. Yeah. But uh, the motion... There's the one paper that I mentioned, the Popovich paper, the mm -hmm. one about... Uh, the motion fields one. Yes. I think that's been the most recent... Um, well, so the, um, the guy who wrote that paper, the, ma the main author, was hired up by Bungie. And there are rumors mm -hmm. about that, but I really don't know much uh, about it. I think no, it, They but, said they tried it in their SIGGRAPH talks. Oh, yeah. And then they, they stopped. They, didn't they threw it, they it out. Oh, it. that's such yeah. a shame. I think they used it for some small things, but in general, they, they didn't use it. Uh, uh. So uh, I'd be very curious to hear what the challenges are there. What uh, I mean, the things you've said probably like figuring out where the data uh, is missing and where it's okay, and you you can't tell that immediately without extensive tools. I think there's also a very big open problem that none of the papers really address in a sensible way. Is how do you describe the problem accurately for that uh, motion graph? How do you explain the intentions that you want? to that black box yeah. and I don't have an answer for this and I'd love to see how you could formulate that in a mathematical way to say, mm. you know what, I'm actually, I want you to run forward and then start crouching mm. and turn your facing angle and this is different from you going into cover, yeah. which, you know, velocity wise might be the same kind of intention. So it's, yeah. I don't know how to describe that with a lot of, without a ton of annotations. Well, so I think that's the, the that's kind of a more forward-looking AI animation interface where you just say, I'd like you to go somewhere and I'd like you on the way to, to you know, like various constraints to be maximum height here at this particular point in time. And it, it, becomes, a, it becomes a completely different interface of uh, the way we used to thinking. Used but then to think how do you, now. that's the thing is you, you can sort of do that, but there'll, there'll be times when some motions are very similar but visually are very distinct or functionally they're very distinct. Yeah, so you need tagging for sure. I think that's, yeah. the, 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 you know, there's no, um, uh, for things like style, uh, I don't think you could ever rely on an algorithm. You have to say, please try and use this subset of motions or you have some kind of functional solver that solves the basic motion and then you apply modification. There was this cool paper called Style IK a while ago. Uh, I think it was about the same time as um, uh, the, the motion graphs um, and they could basically stylize any animation after it had been generated. And I think those kinds of pipelines are very good because it goes back to like uh, what Richard Evans calls the adverb problem. Um, so basically say, move over here, but sadly. <laughs> mm. Right, so then you generate your basic motion as a functional thing with lots of mechanical constraints and doing things with very optimal outlooks and then after that you sort of apply some kind of uh, post processes style saying well he's going to move slower and here he's going to and so on so maybe that's um, I mean that's super forward looking and <laughs> I don't know don't know when we'll ever get there I don't know it'll be nice to go in those approaches this is why like there's this package called Ikinema that has a lot of potential right now that I'm yeah. still kind of looking into because they have some interesting ideas where they it's fundamentally a constraint solver yeah. Um, but it has some interesting features like, um, what do they call it, center of mass, 
Mm -hmm. So it has a center mass uh, simulation where it will actually tilt the character based on the slope and these kind of things. Wow. Try to, yeah. to keep to, to sort of do a balancing technique. Yeah. And primarily, it's only nobody's using it at runtime, but it's used for like editing tools. Yeah. yeah. But it has some very interesting results. This is something that. I think that we can take raw animation data and mm -hmm. instead of building these slope uh, variants, you know, of a walk cycle forward, walk cycle up a slope, down a slope, and then try blend, we could have just a forward walk cycle and apply something on top of that to say, mm -hmm. hey, this is the motion, please adjust your center mass according to yeah. your environment. Yeah, yeah. As, a, as a node that. in the tree, uh, it could be like another exactly. post-process node, right? Oh, that's interesting something in front of like your locomotion state or on top of the locomotion state saying, hey, here's the pose that I'm going to get out. I don't care what I'm doing. Adjust it to take into account the your center of mass, you know? Whoops. <laughs> that was subtle uh, rounding, not what I intended. Yeah. Um, yeah um, I'd like to go back to that um, the graph thing, though. Okay, no. <laughs> I think uh, this forward-looking thing, I don't think, is what we're going to solve today. But certainly, no, one, no. certainly one to think about. But uh, let's, um, I'd like to break down the graph problem a little bit more. Um, let me see. Make some more space here. Um, so in a traditional animation graph, if you don't look at it hierarchically, then you have lots of uh, motions, which are pretty much all interconnected. And they'll be uh, like very densely connected, typically, I guess. Um, yeah. So w when you say child graphs, you mean in the same way that we have like hierarchical finite state machines, where we basically you know, that's more of a potato than a <laughs> than a graph node. So here, instead of having a transition to a single node, we'd have a transition to an entire uh, subgraph. Is that what you mean? Yes. Okay. Fundamentally, yes, because. Um at the simplest level, each one of those nodes produces a pose at a given time. Yeah. And all you're doing is you're saying, hey, the, the source for this pose is this child graph. Yeah. That's all it is. You don't, you don't care what's inside of it. It could be mm -hmm. just an animation source. It could be like yeah. a horrendously complicated state machine. All you know is for some functional state, this is the pose at this time. And that allows us to plug stuff in at runtime that we don't even know about exist. Yeah. And it's a nice way of decoupling, especially environment interactions that you that you know often vary depending on the environment, the situation, whatever. Yeah. It's stuff that a lot of people would shove into their graphs, and you you've seen this in the past where you you have these insane trees that contain everything, like every single door opening animation, every single <laughs> sitting animation, yeah. this kind of stuff. And we don't need to do that. But again, this concept of abstracting the data out doesn't seem very widely propagated to the industry and you know I've had a hard time even arguing for it with some people that you know built an anim graph runtime and said we don't need this <laughs> you know everything's yeah. in one tree we have we have the entire character in one tree it's fine and you know it's very hard to to motivate I think a lot of people still see the animation as very game layering yeah Whereas I see it more of a system. I see the, the Oh yeah, I'm with you on that one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they still treat it as game code and I don't think that's correct anymore. So um, like in a traditional finite state machine, um, you can basically express or flatten any hierarchical state machine uh, as a uh, as a flat state machine. So in this case I'd break it down by having like three times this transition over to here. And if there's a transition out, I would have like another three times uh, the potential transitions from these sub-child nodes. Uh, but I think in animation that seems it might be different because you may have like different blends or combinations of these child nodes, right? Mm -hmm. or, so there's no clear... Uh, it, it's, not, it's not... Do you think you could flatten a, a hierarchical animation graph into a flat no. animation graph? Functionally, no, I, don't, I don't think so because one of the biggest benefits of the hierarchical approach is that I could take something like locomotion yeah. and put a layer on top of that saying, hey, this is a hand offset layer. So, and that itself would then be a node that goes into a higher level graph. So what this function is telling me is that, you know what, rock motion, but I'm layering something continuously over the top of everything else. Yeah. And there's no way of me flattening that without now duplicating the nodes and 
you know, having a layer node per state, making sure they're all the exact same timings every time mm -hmm. I do transitions. Okay, so, so in this case, for example, this subgraph could be entirely reused elsewhere. Uh, is that what you're saying? You mean that gives you the modularity in the same way a behavior tree allows you to reuse a subtree in different places? It's, I think it's more like it's, because a behavior tree isn't by its nature temporal, whereas an animation graph is, every node has a time Every node has an active time, and every node. Well, a behavior tree has that, aware. right? A behavior tree has some time. It's just that uh, in a behavior tree, you would only ever have one of these nodes active. Like in a behavior tree, it would only be this dude, and he, uh, and then only when he's finished does that sequence uh, over to this, the next. Yeah, but it doesn't maintain an, an internal time state. You know, it, you don't have different nodes running at different time intervals, looping some nodes will loop while others are still going on. Sure, you could have, well, you could have sequence nodes or loop nodes in the behavior tree that have their own internal state, right? So they don't maintain the time as a float or double, but they maintain a concept of where I currently am in the sequence or in the action. Yes, where is an animation a lot because of the phase matching. So imagine that you have a additive uh, noise layer on top of a locomotion state that's mm -hmm. matched to your phasing. Yeah. So you have a markup that says left foot, right foot. Uh -huh. Now, I don't really care what I'm doing inside of my locomotion state as long as I can phase match the noise layer to that. Okay. So whether I'm crouching, whether I'm walking, whether I'm jumping, yeah. the noise layer will match the phase that I'm in. And that's the trick with the layering that you'll have this entire state machine with an optional noise layer at a higher level. So I can build the state machine, run it without the noise yeah. layer or with the noise layer. And the noise layer just ends up being another uh, part of the blend tree, like one of those post processes we talked about earlier. Yes, just uh, it's a node in front of mm -hmm. the. Uh, you would, you would put the state machine, and then you would put the um, noise layer as a additive layer on top of the yeah, state machine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so in a in like a traditional hierarchical state machine, there are two things to to figure out. One is the input transitions, and then the the in ingoing and outgoing. Um, so, uh, this is one thing I mentioned on Twitter, but again, it's probably not a, uh, a good format for that. So when you're going into this state, like somehow you're transitioning into this uh, complex uh, node with multiple child nodes, or a state with mm -hmm. multiple child states, um, like in a traditional state machine you'd have a way to specify, like, this is the initialization uh, node, and it goes here. Do you have something similar like in the, in the nested? Uh, yes, um, I have a concept of, um, I call them um, default state. Okay, right. yeah, yeah. Basically it means that when you ever, when the first time you enter a state machine, you have a bunch of overrides for each state um, yeah. that says, hey, if, if these conditions match, then this is the default state. Yeah. Whereas you would manually annotate the default state and you have a bunch of overrides for this, which allows you to, let's say, transition into a state machine and pick a new default state based on the the control parameters that you'd require. Yeah. This is something that wasn't present in the early versions of Morpheme. I have no idea if it's in there now, but it simplifies the problem significantly. Yeah. And that is a, that was a huge pain in the ass. There was also in Morpheme, I, I don't know what it's like now, I can only judge the version I worked with, but uh, doing transitions from transitions was painful. <laughs> You'd have to explicitly annotate that. And you don't need to do that. You can actually just um, simply just do a transition from a transition without any sort of annotation by just yeah. having the graph uh, step through, you know, allowing you to just uh, transition from the target state yeah. immediately. Um, so in these cases, um, when you have a default entry point and then these nodes can sequence between each other, I think you can flatten the graph out pretty easily. Uh, and why would you want to? No, I'm just saying it's it's then it would be functionally the same. So like to win the argument against someone who says why should we build this? Uh, there's no way to win that argument except by saying oh it's just going to simplify some transitions. The thing is the blend tree and the state machine is a different concept. Like no, I know, I know. I'm just saying in terms of the state machine that if you if you have a default node, and then from there you're uh, sequencing between these child uh, states, then it would be the same as, as blowing that out into a fl So there's nothing you could do with this that you couldn't do without uh, the hierarchy. A hierarchy? Yeah. Uh, yes. There isn't, except there's one thing, again, this, you can still do it, it's just a massive pain, yes. Let's say I, I build this graph, and then I decide I need, a, I need a layer on top of this. Yeah. It's trivial to do with a hierarchical system, I just add a layer on top of the hierarchy. 
Yeah. With a flat system, I'd have to add like, I don't know, I'd have to add one layer per transition. Yeah. At every single point, yeah, it's yeah. a nightmare. Yeah, it's the same argument for, for behavior trees, for example, and that kind yeah. of uh, modularity. Yeah. Which um, is why something like Mekin and yeah. I, I, I get terrified because they don't have that concept. Yeah. And every Mekin example I've seen has been this massive, giant, flat uh, the state machine. It's this, this enormous state machine, and it's, it's terrifying for me. <laughs> So in, um, uh, which one was it, in uh, Natural Motion's product, was it, um, did they integrate the state machine with their blend tree so these things could exist as a node inside the blend tree? Yes. Okay. So that, so, I think that gives you a lot more expressive power, right? Because, I mean, exactly. it's potentially such a nightmare to optimize because every time you step into a node, then you have to run a simulation and then you'd have to optimize it in two phases and go through the logic first and then traverse and get whatever all uh, blend operations you'd like? It's it's actually, Morphine does it in a lot of passes. Um, okay. I've been able to reduce that to two. Yeah. The first pass would update the state, yeah. and the second pass will extract all the post tasks yeah, that you need. Yeah, something similar. Well, yeah, yeah. Um, and it becomes relatively trivial. Like, to build an Anim runtime is, is a relatively trivial task. Mm -hmm. You can do it in a couple of weeks. The, the real catch is the tooling. That is the hard part. It's not the runtime. <laughs> yeah. The runtime is trivial. Yeah, to make the, it the make it look around it is to make it look better than what I'm drawing here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the tooling is the problem. Yeah. Um, um, so I'm wondering if because uh, initially when you um, when you mentioned um, child graphs, I thought that um, you'd have like different different features on entry, and this is why I thought pose matching turns out to be useful because when you're entering a state, you might want to do that kind of pose matching. So I mean, instead of having a default, you could quickly do a a very like uh, fast enough for runtime pose match, and then decide dynamically. Well, uh, in this case, for example, I want to go into this state because it matches better than all the others. Um, and this is the thing that you're making the mistake that uh, the states are light, and uh, you can figure out what pose it's in. But that's not true because that state itself could contain a state machine, yeah. which could have other states. So, which what's the pose that results when it's at? At what time does that pose result? Well, then yeah, I guess you have to traverse I, the whole tree and then ask it. You know, so. <laughs> it's it's yeah. infeasible be, because based well, on it, the phase you're in, you'll trigger different transitions, yeah. as well, and that is uh, it's complicated. I think it's possible. I mean, it's the same as a behavior tree, right? When you go into a behavior, you don't know necessarily if it's going to run. You have to go all the way down to the leaf node and see, okay, yes, it's actually going to run. So it becomes very much like a depth-first traversal of the graph to see, well, is this actually a good thing? Or, And in the case of pose matching, you basically have to potentially investigate all of these states to say, well, what it, <laughs> what is the right thing uh, to match? It becomes, I, uh, I guess, more AI style than... Um, I, I don't think it's possible because imagine I have an IK node inside of one of those states nested deep, yeah. and that IK node will have a different result depending on the input parameters every time I enter that state. So I don't know what the pose will be. I don't know if I'll even have a matching pose. And yeah. then the question is, do I just match feet? Do I match arms? What's my Yeah, well, you would matching? specify that as a parameter, right? So. Yeah, but it becomes... It becomes I mean, it's, so I think it's impossible to do generically, but I think in most of the cases, your IK is going to be a post-process. You may have, let's say in this case, for example, if we guarantee the maximum depth, if, if this node here stops... Uh, it goes no deeper than these three or four animations, and these four animations are directional falls, and we instead want to match which one goes best towards uh, the target location that the ragdoll is falling towards, and you could pose match and go into that uh, and handle that within the within the, the graph logic. I mean, you would have that logic somewhere, I guess. In my case, where are you, where are you going to put that logic that selects which fall to play, or the parameter of the fall animation? Uh, based on the ragdoll. You would have that internally somewhere, but you also say that IK is a post-process, and that's not entirely true because the IK will run wherever it's hit in the graph. It won't run after the graph is evaluated. Yeah. So it will modify the poses as it gets hit. So potentially you will be... This is another thing that some yeah. people leave IK right after the animation update. And I think that's wrong because Sometimes you want to blend from an IK result to a new IK result. Yeah. Imagine I'm reaching for a door and I'm IKing the hand to the door handle. And then I want to blend from that to actually reaching somewhere else. And I'm still yeah. IKing to that new target. I can't blend the effectors. I need to do the two IK passes and blend the results of that. Yeah, yeah. And, and this is the thing is that 
as you keep messing with the pose internally, the deeper you go down in, mm -hmm. trying to do a pose match on the actual animation result. Yeah. Okay, so you can't. It's difficult, yeah, well. especially if you split the pass into two, because I don't calculate the poses as part of my graph traversal. I calculate that as afterwards, because a lot of times with LODs, mm -hmm. you don't need to do the pose calculations. You simply just need to, to update the graph state and get the displacement out. Yeah. But you don't need to calculate the actual poses, which is why the phase matching approach uh, with the synchronization tracks um, makes the most sense for hierarchical graphs. Yeah. Pose matching makes sense if you're doing these kind of like single nodes. Like, uh, for example, a motion graph would work with pose match because it'll be a pose task. Yeah. Uh, so I think you could. Out, okay. So you could support that in the cases where you only ever have uh, like leaf animations in a node, right? Yeah, or you have very specific nodes yeah. that, you know, as part of the transition to them, you have to feed in the poses, the input, you know. Yeah. That, that works because the way I like to think of it, the tasks should be completely independent of the graph as yeah. well. So I should be able to run them with any graph structure, even if it's hand-coded. Yeah. So in this case, it means that you can't do any kind of look-ahead in the animation graph for probably for computational reasons. Um, you can for things like events and for displacement, yeah. but you can't for poses. Well, you could. It's just really expensive. It's just really expensive, yeah. And I don't know if there's ever a need for that. I mean, your displacement and your events should give you all the information you need to, to make any sort of decisions. Yeah. I mean, ideally, we want to be able to just disable the post calculation as soon as the guy goes off camera, right? But still get all the displacement out of animation-driven locomotion. So... You know, you want to have that that ability to separate that out. You also want to be able to say, hey, if they're very high LOD, we do uh -huh. all the IK passes. If they're very low LOD, we do all the pose operations, but we ignore all IK passes. Uh -huh. so these, we run these tasks, or we ignore these tasks. Or it gives you a lot more flexibility in terms of um, LODing without having the authors of the graph care about that in any way. Yeah. You completely abstract the problem away. And again, most of my comments are, uh, I guess, more production-oriented. Mm -hmm. But it's it's watching a lot of smarter guys than me bang their heads with these problems in the past <laughs> and learning from that and saying, okay, well, that guy struggled for forever and this is the best approach that he found, so I'm going to make use of that. <laughs> or you know, yeah. watching other guys swearing at something for weeks. <laughs> and there's also one thing I didn't mention. With the graph approach, physics has to be part of the graph. You have to do your graph eval, taking physics yeah, into but that's, that's super slow as well. I mean, all the stuff you're saying about uh, pose matching being slow, physics is the same. You have to feed in all the, all no, the whatever you, you, you positions. And, I mean, you, you have really to either don't. take the previous frame or, like for example, no. seeding a ragdoll or dynamically driving a ragdoll or those types of things. You, you, you really don't because uh, if you split the pose update, from the physics, sorry, the, the, the graph state update from the post task update, yeah, yeah. you can put a physics node in the state updates and you would update the state. You would then done, do the post task registration code, yeah. which would then split them into pre physics and post physics tasks with the correct inputs for that frame. Mm -hmm. You would run your physics update and your pre physics animation tasks, feed the pre physics animation tasks into the physics system get the result back and continue out your yeah, yeah. animation update. And you can easily embed physics into your anim graph for free. Yeah, so you and you, you don't have the uh, frame lag issue. And you don't have to worry about uh, a lot of these issues. Oh, it is not cheap. Yeah, that's... <laughs> well, there's no, there's no additional cost to it. The only thing is you're uh, um, getting, well, you're basically deferring some of your animation tasks yeah. post physics. That's that's the only catch is some of your post calculations will happen post physics, and this also gives you the benefit of that the physics system can also, um, you know, take the exact animation update into account, and you won't have things like those uh, interpenetration due to frame lags and whatever else. Yeah, yeah. So in this case, you basically have to traverse the tree each time and say, is there anything you want to do in? Uh in, in this pre-physics? Uh, no, it happens automatically. The, you traverse the first time, yeah. and one of the nodes will be a physics node. Yeah. And that will split the post-task registration into a pre-physics list and a post-physics list. 
Okay, so you there's a restriction. Okay. Yeah. There's a restriction that you have one physics node per branch, yeah. obviously. And at that point, you'll have a set of tasks that say, hey, these are pre-physics, these are post-physics. And obviously a set of physics tasks that are like the right, so updates you, and the motors. So you traverse the tree once, you collect a bunch of operations. Some of those operations might be physics-based. Okay. And then you have all the pose updates pre-physics, then you have the physics updates, and then you have the post-physics stuff. Yeah. So you could take like a... Imagine you do a locomotion pre-physics and a locomotion... You have two locomotion pre-physics updates. One of them feeds into physics and then gets blended with the other locomotion pre-physics update. Mm -hmm. You can define that in a graph very easily. And there's no extra traversals, there's no extra anything. There's absolutely no cost to this compared to a regular approach. Mm -hmm. And I think this is something Morpheme 6 and 7 is already doing, except they define it outside of the graph. Whereas I like to put it at the point in the graph where it belongs. Mm -hmm. This also allows you to do this as part of the child graphs as well, because then you will, again, the child graphs become part of the graph at runtime. So you split the tasks again according to that. Mm -hmm. So how closely integrated is your blend tree code with the graph code? Or is the, is the graph just one node inside your blend tree again? I mean, it sounds like, at some cases, you sound like you've got a very clear separation. And then other moments, it sounds like, uh, like you're traversing graphs and blend trees at similar times and... They're the same thing, the, the same graph and the blend The only distinction there, uh, there isn't any. My state okay. machine is a node in the graph. So everything is technically a blend tree. Okay. The only difference is that uh, the state machine node, when it gets its state updated, it actually makes internal state machine decisions. Mm -hmm. But fundamentally, it's a big tree if you want to look at it that way. Yeah. Except at uh, every state machine node, there's no branches, it's just like a big selector that picks one option or another. Yeah, yeah. That's all it is. Um, so everything's very integrated and it's super lightweight. Uh, I don't know, it's not a lot of code. It's a couple of hundred lines of code for the whole thing. But it's, again, I've got the benefit that I've had three attempts <laughs> at this. So, and I've learned from a lot of very smart people. Yeah, yeah. Do you know, kind of from the experience. Have the um, the animation middleware have they been rewritten over the years, or did they get modified and API compatible? And I mean, how there's a, many there's a many animation middleware. There's I, I mean, think I can name two. Have there's animation effects? Okay, three. I guess I don't really count that one as much. Uh, but yeah, there's have which I don't know if people use. I mean, a lot of people actually. I, I don't think it's that it's clumsy. Uh, in terms of tooling, it's it's really really clumsy in terms of tooling. Mm -hmm. The two main ones that I know of is Emotion Effects and Morpheme. And yeah. Morpheme has done a big change, I think, between two and three. Uh, to source views, and they they went all in on the SPU architecture. I don't know if that code's been removed or not. I don't know. Um, but their tooling is it's really good in terms of you know user experience. And I think that's that's a key, key takeaway is that it doesn't matter how good your tech is. If your tool is shit, your tech is shit. <laughs> Nobody's going to understand all the yeah. fancy shit you have if they can't use it. Yeah. You know, you could give me the best uh, technology in the world and give me a shitty API. The end result is going to be crappy because I'm not going to know what I'm doing. Yeah. And Emotion Effect looks close to Morphine. I, I've never actually used it, so I can't comment too much. And I looked at Granny at GDC this year, and they've, they've made a big push to to try and modernize it. But they're very feature incomplete in terms of functionality. Yeah. So they're missing a lot of very basic stuff, but they've made a massive update on what they had. So potentially Granny might be a contender in a few, in a year or two, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but most people actually have their own bespoke animation systems. I think most companies, it's something that is very, it's something that's very kind of tailored to your workflows, to your team. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it makes sense to build it. It's easy to build in-house. It's one of the easier things to build in-house. Well, okay. I mean, the, the, the runtime is, but I guess the tools always take time. I mean, export tools, I've spent long on those. That's just the most boring job ever. <laughs> True, but those are irrespective of your animation runtime. That's the one yeah. nice thing. Yeah. I can swap out the animation runtime, but not touch the... Uh, the export the pipeline, pipeline yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's that's the one nice thing about the the animation system. It's it, it's kind of this really nice layer in between um, the gameplay and the actual export pipeline, where you yeah. can, if you want, 
do a massive overhaul relatively safely mm-hmm. uh, over the course of a project. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, I've seen a lot of interesting approaches and you'd be surprised how I, I would have guessed naively that animation graphs were sort of ubiquitous in the industry, but that's the reality is, is that's not true. You still see a lot of hand-coded um, transitions inside of game code. It's transitioning between blend trees, which basically just pick an animation and blend yeah, from that to yeah. another animation. So what if your um, animation graph was also hard-coded in C++? Would you have fewer objections to it, just the idea that uh, at least you have that, that layer that's separating the two, and then you just hard-code your animation graph in C++? You could do that if you want. I mean, functionally, you get the same result. But uh, I don't know why you would ever want to do that. I mean, I guess this is the argument of, uh, I don't know, Anim code is, for gameplay, I guess the states quite differ quite a bit. Yeah. But with the animation system, you're using a, like, a handful of nodes over and over and over in different yeah, setups. A handful of conditions, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so the amount of nodes you need is something like 10, 15, 20 nodes max to, to do most things. And there's no point just rewriting the, the mm-hmm. assembly code just to assemble those nodes in a different uh, structure. It becomes a little counterproductive. I mean, an XML file will be good enough. You don't need a. Yeah. You don't need to code this in by hand. And um, I think this also means that when you have that graph explicitly, you can search over it and start saying, "Well, how do I get to this uh, target state? And I want to be climbing on this ledge, and I am currently sitting on this couch. <laughs> like, how do you get from this state to this state? And you can, oops, you can search through the the graph, if it's C++, then you're stuck, you can't do any of that. Well, I think, uh, well, if it's C++, you still have the graph structure, it's just... It's implicit in, it's not, well, it's not introspectable unless... Uh, yeah, but you shouldn't, you shouldn't, I don't think that's a good argument for the graph. I mean, the one benefit of the graph is that it's explicit what is allowed and what is not allowed from each, you know, what blend makes sense. You explicitly mm. define that in the graph saying, this is a sensible transition. Obviously, in terms of something like a network game, you have to throw out the window and say, you know what, I have to be able to force the state at any given time due to lag, due to replication errors, whatever else. But that's the one benefit is that you build the graph and you say, these are the explicit transitions that are allowed. I mean, it doesn't make sense for me to be sitting and then climbing the next uh, frame. It, yeah. it never makes sense, you know, and you often don't need to worry about stuff like that. I think the bigger problem is how do you embed hundreds and hundreds of different types of actions into that graph sensibly. And that's more of a big problem. And that's where the child graphs come in to some degree. Yeah, because you can attach those to objects and say, well, this object has this subgraph. So when you're interacting with it, it's kind of knows where to plug yeah. itself in somehow, I guess, like a yeah. smart object type thing. Yeah, there's, there's also an additional technique that I've started using that wasn't prevalent in some of the graphs that I've seen, is that the animation source nodes in the graph, they aren't actual animations. This is something that I, I, I used to have them as actual animation nodes, and it, uh, it kind of blocks you from doing a lot of fancy techniques. What I have now is slots, so that um, the graph defines functional layout saying, hey, I want to take something from this slot and blend it with something from this slot together. And the benefit of that is that that slot can now contain different animations mm-hmm. as well as different animations, different skeletons. So you can imagine that I would have the character skeleton in there, plus I could have the weapon skeleton in there as well, so when he fires the animation, that I can sample both in the character and the weapons animation. If we have stuff like attachment skeletons, like people have attached fancy cloth or backpacks or or we can put animations there and say, hey, when he's uh, firing his weapon, I want the backpack to be animating, I want the weapon to be animating, I want the character to be animating. I don't have to build three graphs. I just need to like combine all the different animation sources for the different skeletons together in a, in a database. And then I can also generate variations based on that without having to ever change my graph, without ever having to modify any of the logic or the uh, flow. Mm-hmm. And that's something that's not very prevalent either right now. Um, and I think we're coming to a point where we have a lot of 
compound skeletons where we are building these very complex meshes, you know, with like a lot of customization and variety, you know, yeah. hair, for example, you might want to animate like a big fancy ponytail for style reasons, right? Which means you now need animation for the hair. But what if the character doesn't have hair? Do you put that in the graph? You need a mechanism to be able to, you know, add these extra animation data mm -hmm. at the point where it makes sense in a graph without ever changing the core graph logic. Yeah. There's a lot of these production issues with graphs that, uh, without them, graphs are very unwieldy, and I can understand why people think it becomes a giant mess. You know, when you have millions of selectors and 50 animations instead of uh, one blend sheet, it can be a nightmare. <laughs> but again, you just need to pull things out and just see what makes sense. But again, it's it's I I I'm making it sound trivial, and it's only because I've had the the fortune of watching other people hurt themselves really badly, myself included. And, you know, after like two or three attempts at this, we're talking to a lot of technical animators and a lot of game designers about what they need and what their requirements are. You start to see these patterns and you realize that what they define functional transitions, but the animation data is something that they want to be able to change later on without ever having changed the graph. It's, uh, it's, I think, the way we should be heading towards, and we should be looking at things like motion graphs and motion fields as additional tooling. Yeah, I look at them as separate existence. problems. Um, so the, the problem you're describing here is a lot of uh, like scaling to lots of different objects, different um, things you would have in DLC, and making something modular that you could plug yeah. things into. AI types, for example, is a very yeah. good example. Thing. Like, I don't want to build 10 graphs because I have 10 different character types when they all have walk forward, shoot, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's the same graph. I just want to be able to swap out the atom data. Yeah. Get different events, different timings, whatever. That, that all, you know. Um, so the, um, the thing I, I see most useful for uh, motion fields and motion graphs is like things like run forwards and then you have uh, uh, like a t uh, like 180 degree turn and then you go to run backwards. Um, and so then from run forward you can go into like sharp turn left or something, uh, turn left and turn right, uh, sharp turn right. And so there's so many different states that this, this particular state machine quickly turns into a hassle because each of these transitions also has to take into account the, uh, the footsteps and uh, making sure you don't, well you pick the right motion at the right time so this turn left might have two different versions one that starts on the left foot one that starts on the right foot and uh, uh, exactly and, and and this is why people sometimes think grass can be a wheelie but a lot of that forward locomotion that you've described there especially for ai can be represented by a single parametric node yeah for ai of course yeah 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 i mean this particular problem with a really large messy state machine was uh, one i did for uh, Max Payne 3, when you have to have a really rich uh, character controllable locomotion that actually you know, responds in those different cases. Um, and I think this is the, this is a really, it's, it's a nasty problem when you use a graph for this. It really, like the graph just does not help you. It, it, it ends up being used because it happens to be there, because it has lots of advantages over here. But then when you start doing things like locomotion with it, it sort of it quickly gets in your way rather than helping. Um, yeah, and, and again, it's, I think that's basically a bunch of people saying, well, I'm going to take some animation data and I'm going to shove it into a graph yeah. without thinking about how to represent this data in the best way using the tool I have. Yeah, I mean, how else would you do this? I mean, it's unavoidable. I think it's a very definition. If you try to feed this problem into a graph, you either do it like this or you have a sequence of like parametric step, like step left and step right. And that's well, you don't need steps. You, no, well, you, I mean, I'm just saying, is if you want a graph, you just have to figure out how to break down your motions into graphs, and there's only yeah. so many ways you can do that. As I can, I can describe the, the AI locomotion graph we had, it had a idle state. Yeah. It had transitions between idle and moving and moving to idle. Yeah. And for each of those transitions, we had, uh, you know, a parametric node based on, you know, that internally had phases, so you could do left or right foot, it didn't matter. Yeah. And uh, inside of the move state, we had a single um, forward parametric blend space that covered, mm -hmm. I think, the forward 180 arc, mostly. So you could parameterize on forward velocity. Mm 
Yeah. And then we had 180 tunes, and that's it. Mm-hmm. We had two 180 tunes that would, uh, you know, cover the back 270, right? Because yeah. people don't, if you watch people walk, they're not going to do a uh, a slow bank to do a 180. They're going to do a quick 180 and then yeah. carry walking f- forward. We don't, often the animation data we make isn't representative of how people actually move in real yeah. life. Uh, so the 180 turn you mentioned you had two, is that because you have one with the left foot and the right foot? or Exactly. And again, um, you can make decisions based on speed, like you can't do a 180 if you're sprinting, you know. Yeah. So you don't need animations for 180 at a sprint, because good luck mocapping that, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've seen that. <laughs> yeah, it's, you usually end up half killing the actor. Or, well, the, so, but the, even if you do get it, and it was, so we heard some really uh, athletic uh, basketball players, and that totally didn't work out because, uh, you know, you end up with a type of motion that's like, that guy's a basketball player. You can clearly see like, how he's walking. And, uh, uh, but the worst part is you, um, you end up with uh, like really shitty responsiveness. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And we figured that... Uh, it, takes, it takes like two seconds to do a turn, whereas people expect that in a game or, or more. And in a game, it sort of needs to be <laughs> much quicker. Exactly. So we, we figured it's easy just to slow the guy down and do a quick 180 and then carry on moving. That looked uh, better and it was more responsive in terms of AI. For a player, it's, I guess, a bit trickier, but I don't know. I, I don't have very much experience with uh, players as such. But again, I can imagine a lot of the motion can be represented in a single parametric node. No, I, yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. I really struggle with that because it's, it's harder than you think, especially when you get into strafing. Because um, then to go back here, like you have, uh, like, so this is just the forward states, right? So, if you want to have the dude facing in one direction, uh, so you, for example, then you'd end up with um, like uh, facing left and then moving right and then facing right, moving left, and then you have to schedule between the uh, facing right, moving left, and facing. <laughs> left moving right and if you want the feet to not get shuffled up during the transitions then you have to handle those all those as special uh, like transition phases as well and it kind of uh, it, it quickly blows up the whole space you end up with uh, I can't remember how complex it was but it was, we, it was crazy one thing we looked at and this was just my idea at the time was for strafing like nobody really strafes oh, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Life, nobody, nobody strafes we talked about for, that also yeah yeah for, for players, yeah, you can maybe add that in for the players. But for AI, it's unnecessary to do straight you animations. You walk it's forward. Ridiculous. Yeah. yeah, and just uh, tilt the body. And you yeah. can cover most of the variation. Again, yeah. it's, it's just a compromise in terms of uh, functionality. Just step back, look at it, and say, yeah. do I really need to do this? What is this bringing to the table that is so much better? I mean, are the players even going to notice it? There's tons of game out there that... Like Counter Strike, the animation quality is atrocious, <laughs> and yet it's got yeah. it's it's got the most unique players right now out of any game. It's it's insane. Um, sometimes the stuff that we think players care about, mm. they don't, and the stuff that we kind of say, well, this is hard. I'm not going to focus on this. That's the stuff that gets called out, you know. And I guess these days I'm more okay with having feet sliding a little bit more. And having a sure. very simple debuggable system, rather than going crazy tech and having no foot sliding, but then <laughs> have to make compromises everywhere else. Yeah, well, if it feels like a tank afterwards, then you're you're gonna pay for it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's 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 also the production costs are getting insane. We need to be smarter, and sometimes. Yeah, I mean, I think different studios have different mindsets in terms of the cost, right? Some of them are like, okay, let's throw money at the problem. <laughs> I'm not going to name any studios, but that certainly happens, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's sad. It's a little sad, you know. That money can be better spent in a lot of other areas. Well, I mean, I'm glad people are, are doing this. I mean, it's, it's interesting to explore that space, and it's moving forwards in some direction. I don't know <laughs> if it's necessarily the best one for everybody, but uh, I... Yeah, I think these yeah. are problems that need to be solved. I really want to see the future of Michael and Simone's uh, yeah. uh, tech. I really want to see where it goes. So and, for this uh, stuff, I think it's perfect, like, right? You could just replace all this whole thing with like, a motion field, in theory. Yeah, potentially, yes. But I would keep it just for the locomotion, for example. Yeah, I would, sure. And nothing sure. else. Yeah, I would as well. Yeah. You know, 
even so, I would I would look into it and say, well, do I need to do all of it with one thing? Do I need to take bits and pieces? You need to sit and think whether it's the that's like everything. Is this the right yeah, tool for the job? Yeah. It's like doesn't matter the field. It's the same question. Yeah. But I see them having uses, but I see them as part of a graph. I don't see them. A lot of people are kind of buying sure. it for, I'll have one motion field and I'm going to control my entire character in this. No, and I don't. Well, it's, I, I, so that wouldn't fit with like your modular DLC that requires a new animation for this object. It needs to plug into that. You can't have your motion field pre-baked to take exactly. into account everything or ship a new motion field every update. It's like a neural network you, you <laughs> seem to be on them lately. <laughs> you know, you've trained them to a certain degree, and then yeah. all of a sudden you feed it some new data and you've regressed. <laughs> you know, and that's the problem. You, you, you have no guarantee that adding something new mm. won't pr pull it back. Whereas with a graph, adding more content in a smaller subtree or whatever else, you're a little bit safe in saying, yeah, this isn't going to break something else. It's not <laughs> like, if I add a ladder animation, it's going to break. Uh, it's not going to break swimming. Mm. Whereas with a motion field. If it's all grouped together, you, you don't really know. Mm. You could add in some bad data that is very similar to some other data in terms of your similarity metric, and then you've broken everything. It, that's the part that scares me, and mm. we'll see if uh, I really want to see what Michael and Simo are. Yeah, so I think you yeah. could easily ship that with the right mindset of saying, well, this is going to be a, a small extension to our existing graph. And then as it works, we'll just blow it up. And it might cover everything that relates to locomotion, you know, like idle to walk, to run, to idle, to uh, uh, standing in cover. Those, all those motions, you might be able to do them in one very smooth motion field. Um, I think uh, like the cover maybe is like the hardest one there. But things like mm -hmm. uh, um, interacting with objects, I don't think you'll, you'll get No, there. but I, I don't think even you could do crouching and stuff very well. With the motion field, because you have to express that desire, you know, in a in a sensible manner, and yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think know, it, I think so. It's I don't, a hard problem. I think it's mostly a um, yeah, yeah. Well, I have to think about that. I think it's still um, still too fresh. I'm not going to speculate today. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to speculate either because uh, again, the more data you've put in, the more yeah. what's the word? robust your similarity metric and your yeah. problem description needs to be. You have to be very like sensible with how you describe the problem. Yeah, yeah. And that is a that is also a, a, an issue. And there's also the other question of like maintainability and keeping this for the future. Imagine this is now built by one Anon programmer and he mm -hmm. leaves. <laughs> but it was the same for driver tar, right? They had that issue where they couldn't hire someone, they wanted a new uh, expert. To, but uh, at the same time, now they're you know they've got a really cool, unique gameplay feature, and uh, you know, uh, yeah, other games are struggling. Uh, I don't know. It it does work in some cases. It is a risk, but well. Yeah. yeah, it's it's also getting new hires. If it's it's a lot easier to train them up on something that's a bit more. Yeah, but then everyone there. would be writing uh, enterprise Java, right? Which most people are, unfortunately. I know. Well, that's kind of a slippery slope argument, but yeah. <laughs> uh, <it's, laughs> I don't think we've perfected even the, the stuff that we consider basic right now, and I think that it's very valuable to have guys investigating this stuff. Mm -hmm. But I definitely think that uh, we still need people to say, "Let's let's perfect what we know," because uh, from what I've seen. It's it's a little bit uh, in terms of animation, especially where a lot of the systems are very rudimentary and they've been left behind because there's uh, and I um, don't know why there's not that many animation programmers out there. Well, I think they're very it's it's a hard skill to be honest. Like I was joking with Mika on Twitter that uh, like animation programming is like AI programming on hard mode. I, I I genuinely feel that way. You know, it's like it's it really it takes a lot of like things that you can knock out as an AI programmer. They're they're easy compared to a lot of the things you do in animation. Um, I actually find it sometimes a little bit easier because I know what the end result's supposed to look like. Well, you've been doing I, it I for how many years, is. right? I mean, I uh, yeah, I think I've well, I've done fewer years of animation than you have. But and visually, so, you can say this is right or this is wrong. With AI, it's a little oh, bit harder too. Mm, so that's subjective. Like for for things like animation, like it takes I don't know. I think it takes you at least uh, a few months, maybe a year, to notice like single frame glitches. 
Like, I, I can stand over someone's shoulder and I was like, say, did you see that? And like, he's new to animation. He wouldn't see it, right? Whereas after a year of messing around with animation systems, you, you see these things. Whereas behavioral bugs are much more obvious, you know, that, yeah. that they are. Yeah, so, I, I don't know. I guess. Yeah, um, I guess it's true. I, I mean, just think it's like all the complexity that makes, everything that makes AI difficult is in animation as well. Like things like modularity that we talked about today. Um, and uh, but you get all the extra math on top of it, like uh, quaternion interpolations and <laughs> uh, yeah, all these uh, different IK algorithms. Um, but I mean, uh, at the yeah. same time, you don't necessarily have to implement them. You could just reuse some middleware, but then you're not, exactly. you're not really an name. Are you then an animation programmer? You become more like a gameplay programmer using an animation graph? Yeah, ideally, that's what I want to see as animation programmers you know, sitting with an animator and mm. building a graph and then writing the, the driving code for the graph. Mm. That's what I would like to see ideally because you get a very fast duration time on that. Yeah. And that's still not the case. A lot of it is still programmer driven and that's can be a bit slow at times. Mm. But uh, mm. I don't know, we'll get there. I think we'll, we'll definitely get so there. So do you think it's mostly an education problem? Because it sounds like those solutions are out there and well partly from you and people you've learned from and people that will be at the conference and uh, middlewares that worked or maybe some that didn't work that still had some good ideas and maybe it's just a question of things you know becoming more uniformly spread a bit like you know behavior trees were like uh, let's say 10 years ago for, and after you know we spent a few years just teaching and evangelizing and you know it's only recently that people really turn to that as a default and it just takes that amount of coordinated uh, PR almost, I guess, to, <laughs> to get these kinds of techniques out into, in front of people and to make them a sensible choice. Yeah, I, I think that's exactly it. I think in terms of animation, a lot of people got an engine yeah. that had an animation system and they were mostly gameplay or AI programs. And they said, well, I don't really care. It works, I can get animation on the screen, yeah. so I don't particularly care. And I think a lot of the big engines that have been used, like Unreal, I mean, Unreal 3 did not have state machines for its animation graphs, right? It, it didn't have much of a animation system to to to, to go with. Whereas um, now they're starting to add state machines and they're starting to add these graphs. They're still doing it in a interesting way where they're still merging gameplay and animation together with the blueprint, but it's it, it's, it's stepping in the right direction. Yeah. And engines like Crytek, like even Cry today, CryEngine doesn't have any sort of graph for the animation system. Right, there's yeah. a lot of engines out there that are legacy big AAA engines that have no concept of animation graphs, and they're still being used today. You know, widely used, and it is a matter of education. You know, people just have never seen it, they've never used it, they don't know it, they're scared. Yeah, they don't see the right? benefits. Maybe yeah, yeah. They they maybe touched it once at one point, saw a giant mess result from it, and say, well, yeah. they get scared away and. That's what they know. <laughs> if I have to hear that one argument that you know animation graphs become a giant mess, it it drives me crazy. But I hear it all the time. Yeah. So. I mean, it, they do, they do. They just that's that's the very. It's not because of animation graphs. It's nobody's fault. It's just the problem is a big complex problem, right? So they're just not necessarily, well, part of it is describing the complexity of their solution, like the lack of layering, but partly it's just also expressing the fact that there is a lot of complexity naturally in these kinds of games, and you can't necessarily avoid it, except in certain, you know, modular uh, sub-components where you can maybe put in a motion graph or a motion field. Exactly. I would love to get a tool that would visualize gameplay code and all the transitions. Yeah so that we could generate a graph of saying, you know, this is your gameplay state transition matrix, you know? <laughs> Tell me how this is any cleaner, you know? Because I'm, I can guarantee you that's probably just as messy. Oh, it's probably it's worse, just, yeah. It's just... Well, you could yeah. write everything as a functional programming language and have a function that takes a state and returns a new state. <laughs> that would be awesome, but uh, <laughs> I, I somehow don't see that happening. <laughs> At least not in my lifetime, probably. <laughs> no, because people are stuck on enterprise Java. Uh, C++. Uh, I, I think Python's a worse offender these days. Yeah, well, Python's, because, Python's got its benefits, but not for not for anything huge. Um, it's, it's, it's getting there, right? I mean, it's become the animation tool language, pretty much, thanks to Autodesk. So. Uh, yeah, true enough. Yeah. I mean, it's, I like Python. I do like it. I just don't think it scales to enterprise scale without being very careful, but then no, no programming language does either. So no, It's a super good tool for fast yeah. 
So oh, that that for sure. I've seen yeah. some technical artists do amazing things. We we have had a few tech artists that are half programmer, half animator, that produce these amazing tools, uh -huh. like handwritten in Python, you know, by themselves. <laughs> and it's it's awesome to be able to delegate that work to the people that are going to use the tools. Yeah. You know, when you have somebody writing his own tool, it's 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 the best thing you can you can have, right? Yeah. But uh, yeah, I think we've covered a lot. And uh, Matt, do you have any final words? I, 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 I was going to uh, I was going to wrap it up. Yeah, do you have any final words? I, I think I've said more than enough. <laughs> awesome. Well, um, yeah, I think it was good enough. We can post the recording. I'll cut out a few little bits uh, <laughs> with the interruptions earlier, but uh, it seems like uh, yeah, it could be useful. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, thanks a lot for your time, Bobby. And uh, well, I look forward to you making your code open source. Someday when I'm when I'm not embarrassed by it anymore. But, well, uh, so yeah. what you could do is just leak it, and then you could say, "Well, I'm, I'm embarrassed about it, but it was leaked." You could do like it's a, it's a classic, you know. <laughs> someone created a bomb. Someone created a Bobby Angle of Twitter or uh, GitHub uh, account and accidentally posted it there. <laughs> yeah, maybe I'll make my Bitbucket open one day. I'll have to remove some of the middleware, but yeah, I can probably make it. We'll see. Once it uh, once it actually is usable, I, I I might probably open source it. Cool. Well, thanks but, again. Uh, yeah. Have a good day. You we'll too. Take care. Yeah. See you. Cheers. Ciao, ciao. Bye.